Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Comic-Con at home panel, LGBTQ comics and popular media for young people. Uh, so comics and animation are universal mediums that have recently made huge leaps in presenting queer inclusive stories and characters for young audiences. Um, recently, we've seen some groundbreaking successes, many of them by the people you are seeing right around you now, and unique creative opportunities for queer storytellers like these storytellers. So here we have a mix of animation, raise your hand if you're in animation, there's three of you, four of you, yeah. And, uh, and publishing storytellers, raise your hands please. Yay. Um, and they're here to discuss their projects, their creative perspective, and their professional stories. So first, a big thank you to Ted Abenheim and Prison Comics for making this ha happen and for Comic-Con Comic International for hosting us. So I'm your moderator, Court Lane. I have 12 years experience at Marvel, executive producing uh, animated series like Ultimate Spider-Man and Black Panther's Quest, and Marvel's first LGBTQ inclusive animated project, Marvel Rising. Um, but these creators are much more impressive. We're here to talk to them today. So I'm gonna start off by doing a quick Brady Bunch hello, um, and I'll mention everybody one by one, and they can wave, and then we're gonna zoom in on each person, literally. Um, thank you so much for coming together. This is the most star-studded panel I've ever had the honor of moderating, and that's fantastic. For the fans, thank you so much. Um, so, Mariko Tamaki is here, wave. Um, she's just received three Eisner nominations, which is very impressive. Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me, and Harley Quinn breaking glass. I highly recommend both. Alex, Sanchez is here in Rochester, New York, uh, and he just recently released You Brought Me the Ocean from DC, and Boyfriends with Girlfriends is another title you would know from him. Michael Vogel, you know from My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic and Young Justice, <laughs> and Noelle Stevenson, who just completed five epic seasons of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, Brittany Williams, um, who's published Goldie Vance, um, which was his co-creator and works on DC Superhero Girls, currently Ben 10, correct? Um, a freelance, it was a freelance, Okay. but not currently, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tong Li Wen, uh, The Magic Fish is his book coming out this fall. Um, you also know him from Twisted Romance. And Gina Gagliano, who is publishing director for Random House Graphic. Um, and has brought a lot of great queer voices in the YA publishing format to you all. So Gina, you shepherded books like Witch Light by Jesse Zabarsky. The LGBTQ YA audience has grown so quickly. Why has it happened so fast? And where do you think we are on that trajectory? Thanks for having me on this panel. And um, I'm so excited to talk about LGBTQ graphic novel publishing, because I think it's in such an exciting place. There, there's been an amazing history of queer creators in comics publishing for, for years and years. Alison Bechdel, Howard Cruz, Paige Braddock, it's these amazing people doing all sorts of different work from graphic novels to uh, newspaper comics to more, even more people who work behind the scenes in editing and marketing and, and publishing. And I think that environment of the alternative comics community or the independent comics community, the people who are making mini comics and web comics and zines has grown to be one that's so um, welcoming and accepting of queer content and creators. You know, in, in the past 15 years, there's really been a, a move for graphic novels to be more mainstream. And by that, I mean that they're more available in bookstores and they're more available in libraries and schools. And publishers like HarperCollins, who publishes Noel and, um, First Second, which is part of Macmillan, who publishes Mariko, and Abrams, where Mariko has her own imprint, which is the most amazing, um, have really come into the graphic novel publishing space and 
looked to that alternate independent comics community who are telling these strong personal stories that kind of match up with what's happening in book publishing to be the, the authors that they, they feature. Um, and I think that this is, I mean, people who work in publishing, I, I feel like are all activists. You know, everyone gets into to publishing, um, especially kids publishing, which I work in, because they, they want to change the world. They want to make stories for kids that they didn't see. They want to make more stories for kids that are the, the, for the kids today, for the, the new audience of kids today. And you can't help but look at all of us on this panel and also the world all around us and realize that queer stories are needed. Great. And speaking of queer stories, one of the titles you've just been shepherding is The Magic Fish by Tron, who's on the panel. Uh, what do you think makes this book so unique? So The Magic Fish is the first book that I ever bought at Random House Graphic. And, um, it, I, so I started, I started working at this new imprint and my first week there, the, the last day of the week, I had worked that week to make a list of all of the authors that I would love to work with. And, um, I started emailing people to just be like, Hey, you know, if you ever have a pitch, I'd love to see it. I'd love to work with you. And, um, I got an email back from Trung's agent that was like, so Trung's book is out on submission. It's going to auction at the beginning of next week. Would you like to participate? And I looked at this book and it was queer. It was full of fairy tales, which I love. I grew up reading fantasy and science fiction. Um, it was all about interstitial identity. The art is gorgeous. Like obviously, you know, Trung was on my like VIP list. I'd love to work with you. First email outreach set of people. And um, yeah, so over over that weekend, the, the first weekend I ever had at this new job, um, I talked to a lot of people and figured out how to make this the, the first ever acquisition at Random House Graphic. And I mean, Chung is amazing. The book is a, a delight. Um, I mean, I, Chung, I think you're next up, so I'll leave you to tell people about <laughs> what it's about. Um, but it's it's just, it's so good. It talks about family and it talks about friendship and it talks about identities and perception and um, the experience of immigration and intergenerationality and it just has like all these things that are amazing that I that I love with fantastic art on top of it. All right, Trung, up to you. I'm sure you're blushing a little bit, but could you I am. So The Magic Fish is about a young boy and his mother who are trying to communicate with each other things that are going on in their lives and um, kind of uh, culturally esoteric things that they don't share a language or a vocabulary to properly communicate. And so they're kind of doing it by going to the library, picking out stories and reading fairy tales to each other. So the book kind of has like a princess bride story within a story kind of structure. Um, and I really liked uh, kind of working in that way because I got to tell a lot of different stories. The, um, the Magic Fish started off as a couple of disparate projects and they were all kind of, kinds of different fairy tales that I was fascinated with. Um, and I, I kind of understand fairy tales as sort of being a lot like people where they migrate from place to place and they wear different clothes depending on where they end up. And I really wanted to explore that idea and how resonant fairy tales can often be for people who are going through transitions or people who are going through um, navigating spaces that they're unfamiliar with, like they're oftentimes about transformation and they're oftentimes about change and how that can be powerful and also really terrifying. So I thought that this particular story would be a really great vehicle for all of my fascinations. Oh, excellent. While we're on publishing. Uh, Brittany, um, you mm -hmm. worked on a really diverse, strong set of very smart female characters, both in comics, like your co-creation, 
Gold Advance, my copy, and um, animation work like on DC Superhero Girls. So mm -hmm. really you've been able to attract that kind of work, which is not that easy. I was thinking about it when I was um, reading over the questions. And it's interesting, I have no clue, but I guess this, a lot of the fan art I did in the past that publishers saw and animation people saw, I just assume maybe they just saw it in that work and they would just reach out and I guess it, you know, it fit the theme, you know, thankfully what they were going for. And I guess it just worked out in the animation sense more so. I guess for comics, it was more so a portfolio situation where I, um, I would go to conventions and things like that. And I met um, Alex Antone from DC at DC Comics. And I showed him my stuff and it just kind of went from there. No, but that actually makes sense and is very smart. All your promo mm -hmm. work, the kind of work that you want to attract because that's, if you're a producer looking for somebody, go, oh, yeah, I expect, I'd like the show to look a little bit like that or have characters with some of those. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Exactly. It's like that old say, well, I don't even know how old it is, but you know, draw what you want to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just draw what you want to watch. Just yeah. your dream. Just draw it, you know? And I think it would be fair to say that, uh, Noelle, you've had some of that experience yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Now, um, since we're in animation now, you, you, well, congratulations on five absolutely triumphant seasons. Thank you. The Princesses of Power. Um, and, and this is a, almost a personal question for me, but I think it speaks to the larger topic. So for me, after watching the five seasons and rewatching them, um, it occurred to me that, again, for me, Catra is the most complex young queer character on television I've ever seen. Um, both Catra and the audience they start out hating her and then they begin to understand her and finally end up loving her and want happiness for her. And that's a massive arc. Um, so as much as everyone's a, an Adora fan, how, do you, how did you develop Catra as such a compelling queer character? I think as, as a woman and as a lesbian, I, I had a big hunger for a type of character that I wasn't really seeing in media. It's kind of like Brittany said, you know, just like, creating the work that you always wanted to see and, and reflecting that however you can. Um, and I, I found myself gravitating towards a lot of characters who were really, really messy and like very, they just had like a lot of anger and a lot of like, like just, uh, just all this like kind of messy conflict wrapped up inside that character. And most of the time those characters were male. And that was like the version of that character that people seemed to be the most comfortable with. Um, and, and I related a lot to those characters, especially when I was younger, but I noticed that when it came to female characters, people tended to be a lot more literal about like, if they did something wrong, even if they were mean or unpleasant in some way, people would be like, oh, she reminds me of like a mean friend that I had. And I was just like, we never, like, like I, I want that kind of cathartic character um, that, you know, gets to be angry, gets to be messy, gets to just like, have all these complicated emotions wrapped up in her. And at the same time, I want this to be a lesbian romance that isn't like super cute or like super fluffy all the time. And like, yeah, I, I want it to be meaningful and I want it to connect with people and for them to see themselves in it. So I ultimately do want it to be positive, but you know, I, I, I wanted it to have conflict and I wanted it to be a little bit of a, um, just that kind of like dynamic, just, you know, relationship that I don't think that we always get to see, especially with lesbian characters, just because they are so rare. And so I think for Catra, it just became a very, like, a very personal story, honestly, of just like, I think there's a catharsis in watching characters express the anger and express like that, just like pure rage, I think that it's not acceptable for us to express in our lives, but like, it has to go somewhere. And so I think we can get that through watching fiction, through through absorbing these um, stories. Uh, and that can be something that like, it soothes a part of me, at least to make that. And I, and I think that the reaction to her character, it kind of shows that a lot of people, like they see themselves in her. Most of us have not tried to destroy the world in you know response to that anger, but to watch somebody 
who reflects that darkness in us and then also watch her have a redemption arc and that she can get better and, and change. I think it's, I think it's important to show that, especially for young kids who um, might be wrestling with a lot of that themselves in their own lives. Yeah. Wow. That's really beautiful and interesting. So staying on animation, Michael, uh, last year at this time during Pride Month, you helped bring queer characters, Aunt Holiday and Auntie Lofty, uh, into the series My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. Um, can you talk about them and the publishing start for them and, you know, and how you brought them into television and in such a massive franchise like My Little Pony and with a huge fan base? What was great about Pony is uh, the relationship between the show and the fandom from the very get-go was such that as the fandom sort of picked out background characters that they really liked and would decide that these characters were a couple or those characters were a couple. Uh, and even though, you know, uh, the powers that be maybe weren't fully okay with going there, the storyboard artists would kind of do things in the background. And there was always these characters that were sort of background queer, which is something that any uh, LGBTQ kid growing up sort of recognizes. It's, it's those characters that like exist between the cracks or are undefined in relationships that we all relate to and are drawn to. Just getting those little steps where you get people comfortable, as frustrating as it is, that's something that you have to constantly try and push against and do. Um, and so when Nicole Dubuque and I were doing um, a publishing program for Hasbro with Little Brown called the Ponyville Mysteries, uh, there's one of the characters, a popular character, uh, one of the Cutie Mark Crusaders, Scootaloo, who like her, who she lived with had never really been defined in the show. Uh, and so we kind of just asked if we could give her to Anne. And we got the permission. And so we did it, which, first of all, trying to just trying to write very succinctly two women characters who are both aunts who live together and making it clear that they are a couple and not sisters is like, you're like going over every word to make sure you get it right um, without going, actually, this couple that lives here. Um, but we did, people noticed it, it got some level of attention. Um, and then fortunately, when Nicole uh, took over uh, the showrunning duties for the final season with Josh Haber, uh, she was, since she and I had created those characters, she asked if she could bring them in, got the okay, and, uh, and they were in there. And it's kind of funny to me that like, this or any of these kind of like background characters, parental figures, whatever, get so much attention in animation, but it's just, it kind of speaks to the lack of diversity on this front, that even having like a character's two aunts show up in the show for like a few minutes just caused this massive upswelling of like gay characters and pony in the positive and the negative. Um, but that was kind of the process. It kind of started in publishing into the series uh, and it was just like, you know, it was a bunch of, it was a bunch of people who were part of the LGBTQ community, allies to the LGBTQ community, kind of like just continually pushing on that envelope to try and like just get it a little, little bit further. Um, and I think it's really nice that, although I wish that there's even more that could have been done uh, on Pony, I think it's nice that as we like rounded out the final season of this iteration, we at least had to get, we at least got the opportunity to have some out characters exist. Um, which is a struggle for a lot of people. Yeah, I, and not to make it about me, but I had a similar experience on Marvel Rising uh, when we um, right up front introduced America Chavez as two moms. There was this whole social justice warrior backlash on social media that we didn't really care about that much, but I regret that we couldn't have done more. We sort of ran out of time. And not to like totally fangirl on a Comic-Con panel, but to Noel, I mean, I think that there was this amazing moment because as an animation executive, uh, watching she for the whole, I mean, like from the get-go, I was like, this is the gayest show I've ever seen on every level and I love everything about it. But there was always sort of this, but like, we're gonna go right up to that edge and we're not gonna go over it. And without getting into any spoilers for people who haven't seen she although I don't know why you wouldn't have seen it all yet, by getting to the end of it and watching Katra and watching Adora and seeing how that all resolves, as a, as, a, as a gay animation lover, actually seeing those things that are constantly coded, just kind of said out loud, I was not prepared for the emotional reaction that I would have to that, which I think just speaks to how, I mean, I'm like an adult animation nerd living in LA working in this industry, but to any kid, any queer kid sitting at home watching something like that, like just kudos to you. It was amazing. I burst into tears. I cried for a day. So that's all. <laughs> <Little fan>. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that Michael and three other panelists have in common here is um, work for DC, even though I come from a Marvel background. I really have to congratulate DC 
on um, hiring queer voices and introducing queer characters at a rate other than most major franchises aren't comfortable with. Um, and I think that's to be applauded. And next up is Alex, um, who is working in the DC universe and um, who's just introduced his YA graphic novel, You Brought Me the Ocean. So Alex, what can you tell us about Jake's story and playing in the DC sandbox? Well, thanks, Corey. So uh, You Brought Me the Ocean, it's a, a superhero origin story unlike any other in that it's also a, a queer coming out story and a, and a steamy boy boy romance. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the way it came about is it's part of a line of uh, graphic novels, YA and middle grade graphic novels that, that DC is rolling out to, to reach uh, a, a an audience that doesn't normally read comics. And sort of the, the focus of, of the novels is to tell, you know, more in depth that you can, you know, tell a much bigger story in, you know, roughly 150, 200 pages of a graphic novel than you can in an individual comic book. So uh, they they want it, since it's reaching this this audience of, you know, more, more uh, conventional readers, that uh, they wanted to tell real life teen stories. And so they, they heard about the other uh, gay themed, uh, you know, standard text novels that, that I had written. And uh, so they, they in, invited me to, to pitch an idea for what would be this uh, queer, queer graphic novel. And so while I was writing it the whole time, they were really in, in encouraging me to focus on the emotional core of the story. Uh, not not have it be too, as they put it, not too superhero-y, that they really wanted me to, to delve into the, to the emotions of the character. And it was uh, to be based on the a character Aqualad, the DC character Aqualad, who, you know, has gone through several versions, iterations, like so many superheroes. And in the past one, uh, he'd identified as gay, but again, because it was more uh, comic books or, or TV series, it hadn't really gotten that deep into the emotions the way that a, that a novel can, so that was that was the 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 gist of the idea, and so as I started putting together uh, the the storyline, you know I think we as queer people so oftentimes have uh, immediately seen superheroes as a metaphor for being queer, you know where we so oftentimes have a secret identity, uh, we have a double, we lead a double life. And so I decided to really push that metaphor. And so in, in this book to have uh, the lead character, Jake Hyde, both uh, coming to terms with his sexuality at the same time that he's discovering his superpowers. So part of what I hope makes the, the, the story so exciting is that uh, to actually see the interplay of those two, those two uh, storylines. And you know, as uh, you pointed out, you know, in terms of uh, DC uh, being so welcoming of, of, of queer people that the whole time they were like, there, there were no qualms of, at all about the boy-boy romance and uh, having the, the characters be as, as, as queer as I wanted. And in fact, my wonderful editor, uh, Sarah Miller, she's the one, not, not to do spoilers, but really pushed for the boy-boy smooching. <laughs> That's how I more smooching, more smooching. Uh, it was a lot of fun to work on, uh, both with her and in, in general to, to put the, the story together. And I think, I hope readers will, will, will experience it as, as such a fun story themselves. And there is a really great boy smoochie, an epic, full page. <laughs> so romantic. Uh, wonderful. Mariko, um, speaking of working with DC, uh, your graphic novel, Harley Quinn Breaking Glass, is Eisman nominated. I really wanted to even just ask a question about Mama, um, this great uh, <laughs> drag queen mother figure to Harley Quinn. I myself am a fairy godmother. Aww. I'm going a book for my goddaughter uh, because their relationship is so touching and so surprising for Harley is a quick a character. But I, I really feel I need to ask you about Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up. OK. You write some of the most profound love advice, particularly queer love advice, I've ever read. And it's too funny as a second narrator, um, Anna Weiss, who's a, an advice columnist. And, um, and this, this one quote here. 
It's true that giving can be a part of love, but contra contrary to popular belief, love should never take from you, friend. And um, that's pretty deep. Um, and I think a lot of young queer people are, so, you know, finding love is such, can be a more difficult and rare thing that we, ex perhaps some of us, maybe I'm just speaking from personal experience, accept more challenges than we really should. Um, yeah. Advice to Freddie is, really important for young queer people to see, I think. And is Anna Vice your own voice? Um, and what made you decide to have that voice as a narrator voice in addition to Fred? Yeah, I think Anna Vice is like a combination of like the fact that I'm in therapy. So it's like a little bit of like my own Berkeley therapy stuff. And also like probably a little bit of my girlfriend <laughs> and the things that she tells me. Um, and I think it's, you know, I, you know, I, I do think that it is like, you know, to what Noelle was saying too, I think we're all sort of trying to write beyond the kind of sort of, you know, cleansed version of what queer love is, right? This kind of notion because the story was so often, you know, your two girls falling in love, right? Which is not complicated. Falling in love is one thing and being in a relationship is something entirely different. And I think that that just overwhelmingly hasn't been sort of part of the queer canon because we're just so excited to see two people fall in love and like that's sort of you know getting through that and you know the sort of coming out story has been so central that I do think that uh, I spent I have spent a lot of time thinking about you know like what to say about about relationships in general what to say about what it means to be, you know, in love with somebody and connected to somebody and not just your, you know, girlfriend, but also your friend. So I think that I spend a lot of time <laughs> thinking about that stuff. Um, and uh, like, I think the hardest part of Laura Dean to write and the thing that got rewritten a lot was the advice from Anna Vice at the end was like, what to say to this person. I also feel like um, you know, advice is kind of cheap, like everybody has an opinion about your relationship and they're not in your relationship, so it's really easy to, from the outside, say like, I don't think this is working for you, and something else entirely, to say something that's like loving and supportive, so I kind of wanted to find uh, something that felt like what it would sound like to, like, especially thinking of that in that moment, sort of, Anna Vice is speaking to Freddie and they're speaking to the reader. And what do you say to somebody who is, you know, feeling lost about their relationships and their connections to people? So I tried to make it more about saying loving and supportive things as opposed to like, here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. oh, that's beautiful. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and this actually relates to a little bit. This is a group question. And so I'm going to put all of us in gallery view for a moment. And then I'll call on each of you individually. This is sort of a quick round question even though it's pretty deep, and it's how did your own experiences, is there a specific one, as a kid, a teen, a young adult, influence the stories you've created in, in your work that we've been talking about? Are there moments you've taken directly from your own experience? And we'll start with Noelle. I think growing up, I, I really, um, I did not like romance as a kid. I did not like to watch characters kiss. I didn't like romance stories. I didn't like, like the teen books that, you know, my friends were reading. I just was like, I'm over that. I'm too cool for that, whatever. And then I grew up and like hit like, you know, my mid twenties and came out. And then I realized I actually really, really liked romance and, you know, all of the like schmoofy stuff that I hated when I was a kid. And it just turned out I hadn't seen the version that spoke to me. And so, you know, I think that's so much of what I'm trying to do. It's just like uh, the journey that I've been on and the journey to finding love and just, you know, being a loving person in life. Um, all of those things that I thought were like cliches, I had never seen like the gay version of those things. And so like, I think that it's something that's not only great, like great for, for me and for gay people to see themselves reflected, but also I think that it expands what romance can be. And, and, and even people who aren't gay, who are like, you know, I'm hoping that that can actually expand what relationships are and what what to expect from the person you're with and like how to like you know actually like be in a relationship that you're excited about and feel supported in and so I think it's just that's a really really broad uh range of topics but it's like it's something that I think the more we do um 
the more accessible and, and, and hopefully the, those stories will be able to break past those cliches, I think, that, that bothered me so much as a kid. Um, that's my hope, at least. But I also am just really loving getting back into all of the like teen romance stories that I like missed when I was that age. Noelle, you that you read a lot of fantasy when you were a kid, and I did too. Um, I feel like I went right from reading books for middle school age people into reading adult fantasy novels, which was definitely a thing when I was in when I was a teenager because YA publishing wasn't so much a category. Like there were a few YA books that were out there, and this um, like very supportive gender of YA publishing community just like wasn't around when I was a kid. It started in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And reading these, these middle school age books, like books like The Babysitter's Club and The Sleepover Friends, and then all of the other books that I read that were like Laura Ingalls Wilder and Caddy Woodlawn and these like, you know, quote unquote, like classic American stories. It's an interesting experience to look back on them because I feel like they very much normalized this like middle class, upper class, like white, basically suburban experience. Um, and that was the environment that I grew up in too. Um, so now working in publishing and looking back at that and being conscious of that and looking at kind of the new diversity of voices in fiction and in comics that are available in those areas, it's definitely something that I look at um, and think, what, what are the things that we want to say are normal? Um, and one of the things that I want to say is normal is the queer experience as a kid, not only as a teenager, but as, you know, someone in middle school. One of the things that I want to say is normal is, you know, having the experience of a, a black kid, an indigenous kid, um, an Asian kid, like all of these experiences are part of what America is today. And they're things that kids should be reading and seeing in their, their fiction. I, I also grew up in like a, a middle class white suburban kind of world. And I, I really liked growing up. Like I loved, I loved middle school. I loved high school. I loved hanging out with like a huge group of people. And I had this thing, I was so influenced by pop culture. I was so influenced by the cartoons that I watched and the movies that I watched that when I figured out I was gay, I was scared to death that if I came out of the closet, I would lose my place in my social group because obviously you don't get to be, you don't, you don't get to hang out with those people anymore because when you watch any TV show, any cartoon, there's just no queer people. So I, which is, when you look back on it, that's a, that's a weird way to think about it, but I think I was probably overly influenced by pop culture. So I was just convinced there was no place for me. Um, so, you know, got older, grew up, came out of the closet, was lucky enough to have friends who made it clear that that was not the case and, uh, and, and, and feel really good about my life and the support group that I have. But now working in animation, what I've become very interested in is not just queer representation in animation in general, which I think is super important and that's something that we should all do in, in comics and in publishing and in all young adult areas, but even in the younger shows, like even in the places where when you even bring up putting a queer character, everyone like clutches their pearls and freaks out. But like in like those bridge shows, in like those preschool shows, because I think that the, the younger that we can get where we see characters that are queer, characters that are different, characters that represent all the letters in the LGBTQ and plus. Um, I think it doesn't just normalize it for the queer kids out there, but I think it normalizes it for every kid out there and everyone grows up just feeling like this is the norm. And that's the way, you know, it should be. I think, I think the world is better for gay. Like I think that for all of my friends who are straight, cisgender for everything. I think that adding the diversity to everyone's world makes it a little bit more awesome. And so I think that the more places that we can do that and the more that we can sort of bring it to all aspects of the, uh, of the world of young entertainment through all the different avenues, I think it just, it, it'll make it so that there's not gonna be some kid out there like me who was convinced he was gonna be shunned by every single friend. 
now, especially with all of this work and the explosion of it in the last few years. Um, yeah. Any young experiences, young queer experiences for you that informed your work, like let's say with Goldie? I read the character descriptions in the script and there was no like physical descriptions of the characters. So I was like, okay, well, we'll just make, you know, this is Florida, especially like in um, the early 60s. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, let's just do everything that nobody wanted to see back then. So <laughs> I was like, <clears throat> the majority of the characters are black and her parents are interracial, you know, and I was just drawing the world at the hotel. And I was just doing exactly what you wouldn't see, like maybe in a classic movie from the 60s, you know, set in the same situation. So it was more of like a, again, what I wanted to see and like a, a like a big rebel move. I was like, I'm just going to draw this exactly how I want to draw this. And for all of that, because she so defies expectations, but so fits in the mm -hmm. world at the same time, which is a great balance. She really stands out as a character who is massively appealing. Like she's just incredibly likable um, and so different from everybody else. Um, yeah, that's, that's wonderful, thank you. So next up, Trung. Any young queer experiences that informed your work like The Magic Fish? Um, I'm trying to figure out how to be concise because this is such a huge question. <laughs> um, so I think, I wanted to tell, and I keep saying this whenever I'm asked about the magic fish, I wanted to tell a story that's really small. Because oftentimes, from what I remember growing up, I would read a lot of queer stories and they're always kind of told from the top down, from like a very semantic perspective where a character would come out and the conflict would be um, trying to communicate across first principle arguments, trying to, you know, trying to navigate a lot of conversations about like, oh, like, I think being queer is bad. I think being gay is bad. And then, like, the protagonist has to overcome that somehow. And so I get a lot of pushback. Like, <laughs> when I try to tell stories about immigrants and when I try to tell stories about queer people, there are always people kind of within my own camp who are like, oh, my God, not another coming out story, not another smelly lunchbox story, not another immigrant story. There are a lot of facets that we have yet to explore. And I feel like we're already at a place where people kind of feel like they've seen it all just because they have certain tokens and tropes to which they can hold on to. And I think that the solution to that is to tell like a greater breadth of stories. Um, personally, within my own experience, I remember reading a lot of stories where like a protagonist would come out and it would be really fraught. There would be this question of safety. And I think there is this really kind part of authors who put stories like that out into the world as a way to help kids manage their expectations, to help queer kids understand that the world is not a safe place for them oftentimes. And I think that that can be really important. But for my part, I had a surprisingly very positive coming out experience with my immigrant Catholic family. A part of my struggle kind of coming out to them was understanding and trying to figure out like how I can talk about it because we lack a common language to talk about the nuances of queerness. We don't have, like when my parents were growing up, there wasn't even a word for gay in Vietnamese. And so now that the language has evolved, we're able to have more conversations about it. But when I was in high school, we didn't. And in this book, um, the principal relationship is not romantic. It's between a queer kid and his parent. And one of the things that I really wanted kids to kind of be kind of normalized to is the expectation that your parents should protect you. I want queer kids to know that the adults in their life should be expected to help them feel safe and to support them, whoever they are. So I, I kind of wanted to kind of make an immigrant story and a queer story where the central conflict isn't whether or not my parent will support me. It's about well, how do we express to one, one another that we love each other? And how do we talk across languages and across cultures in a way that can get to the idea that, yes, like I support you and I love you and I don't know how to say it, but here's how I'm going to take care of you. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, Alex, any young queer experiences informed your work? Yeah, so for uh, You Brought Me the Ocean, Jake Hyde, it's like, it's like so much of his experience is drawn on my experience, you know, starting out, you know, when I was a teenager, I, well, even now all my life really, I've loved the ocean. 
And so that's a huge part of, of uh, this story. In fact, when I was a teenager, one of the, you know, it was, it was a very scary and confusing time for me in, in large part because of my sexuality, trying to figure out who I was. And uh, my mom, she sort of sensed, what, you know, something was, was going wrong. And so she bought me scuba diving lessons. And so the ocean was like my place, right? My refuge and uh, where I lived in, in uh, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. The water there was so murky that when I would go on these dive trips, it's like we had to buddy up and hold each other's hands. And so, like, that was my one time I got to hold the guy's hand. So it had that, you know, that, 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 those warm connotations as well. And just the whole sort of, uh, you know, the crushes, the, the crushes, remembering my crushes on, on other boys. And, and uh, the story, I mean, it's, you know, intentionally, you know, pun intended, it's a fish out of water story and that feeling of being an outsider. So it's like, you know, when, when I write, it's like I, I constantly, you know, write remembering what it was like to be a young person, capturing those experiences. And, and finally, Mariko, um, the same question for you as well. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm always kind of digging into like the penny jar of like my queer crushes from my childhood. Like someday <laughs> I will write my writing camp counselor that I fell in love with story. Like I haven't done it yet, but like it's definitely in there. Um, I mean, my girlfriend calls me out all the time about the fact that most of my stuff is kind of a reaction to like what I was watching as a young queer person, which was, for example, like John Hughes, right? Like, and I think like, you know, for, for me, for my generation, you know, the stuff that we grew up with, which, you know, now we, we watch and see how problematic it is on so many ways. So I think it's kind of like, I think I'm kind of already always revisiting the sort of canons of my youth and the sort of things that I, you know, it's like you said, like the sort of background queer character that I was like always drawn with. Like I was like, that substitute teacher, that's like my person, that like person like way in the third row. I was always like honing in on that person. So um, yes, I'm, I'm always paying homage to like 16 year old me watching like 16 Candles um, and feeling like, you know, all these girls were, you know, like that they, they're pursuing these idiot guys and they, they could so easily have like, you know, Joan Cusack is just like right there. Like, why not, why not like that set up, you know? I have to say that Laura Dean is kind of that. Oh, it's exactly that. Yeah, my girlfriend was just saying to me yesterday, she was like, that's so what that is. And I was like, yeah, we don't have to talk about it. Like, yes, you're right. This has been such a great discussion. We only have about 10 more minutes, but I want to get through all of you. And first up, Brittany. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that I love about Goldie Vance is the way you use the visual language of comics to communicate her emotions for Diane um, using that language. Um, and, you know, for instance, she gets these blush lines on her cheeks and cartoon eyes um, in reaction to Diane. But there's this, also this lovely page where if you can see it, she has three thought balloons of Diane looking at her and smiling and a wink. And it's the first time you realize she has a crush on Diane and that's all you need. Um, <laughs> very chatty character, but you didn't need to do this through dialogue. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, for that particular um, panel sequence, I was thinking it would be interesting, especially that young, when you first fall in love. It's, you, I, like, I guess you feel it more so in your heart, so you can't really relay it. So I was like, it would be cool if it was like a heartbeat. So boom, boom, boom. And her face is in <laughs> the beating. But um, I just, I just feel like a lot of people, you know, they use um, expressions and, um, and body language to communicate feelings and emotions. And it's like, I guess specifically for this story, since they're so young, yeah. it's like, how do I articulate this? So it's more so like, you know, you know, like reactions and things like that, I think are more effective in a way. I think so, better than. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a little blush or maybe a hand gesture, you know. I like visual acting a lot too. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I have to say that the visual language of comics also, Alex, and you brought me the ocean, mm -hmm. there's something wonderful with color palette that you can do, that you do. Can you talk about that? Sure, well, this is where I get to uh, give a big shout out to the, to the illustrator, Julie Morell, 
who probably, you know, a lot of you all know from uh, Blue is the Warmest Color, uh, uh, wonderful lesbian uh, love story. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful story. Yeah. And, um, and as she came out as a transgender uh, this year, and uh, she, uh, so they, uh, they have, the, the, the drawings that they did for this were just absolutely amazing. And uh, so in terms of the color palette, the way it works is that there are two basic palettes, and one is more sort of uh, earth tones in this, in this uh, uh, splash here, the sort of more muted soft colors. And then as the story evolves and uh, Jake is, uh, you know, coming to terms with both his, his sexuality and uh, his uh, superpowers, then the, the colors start, start brightening and becoming more sort of the, the, the turquoise water watercolors. And then uh, what Jules did that was uh, so, so amazing was that uh, as the book continues, then those colors keep getting brighter and brighter, the blues keep getting deeper and deeper. So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience so working, working with, with Jewel. And uh, part of what I love about what they did was, was uh, you know, so much emotion in the characters' faces and so much action uh, between uh, the characters. And uh, for me, you know, it's my first time working on, on a graphic novel. So to learn how to, to write that and, and, and give, give the illustrator then lots, to, lots of room to dig in and, and really bring, the, bring those to life. It was, a, it was a magical process for me, you know, having just written standard text in the past and to watch someone else interpret the characters and, and, and bring them life. Thank you. And a similar question for you, Trung. I haven't seen much of The Magic Fish. It comes out this fall. Um, but your, your line work is really gorgeous and intricate. How does that communicate things through that visual style? Sure. Um, so I kind of come from a different aesthetic background than a lot of my peers who work in animation or in comics because I don't tend to come from cartoons. I come from turn of the century children's book illustrations. Um, so I looked at a lot of books with like really old um, uh, book plates that were like inserted and attached and glued into the pages of a book. Um, and I come from a, a, an aesthetic background where y there used to be a relationship between like art galleries and illustrated gift books back when color printing started to become viable for publishing. Um, and so the emphasis on my line work is typically meant to convey that the story that I'm telling has sort of the cadence of a really old, really beloved uh, children's fairy tale. Um, that also comes with a lot of limitations because I work in a clear line style, which means that my line work tends not to be super expressive um, in terms of line weight. They're all kind of the same line weight. Um, and the way that I have to convey movement and gravity is a little bit different. I have to do it in terms of like, I have to um, use fabric and I have to use hair in order to convey all of those different things. And so the line work is pretty confident in that region. Um, within the comic, uh, I'm working with a pretty limited palette and there are certain timelines and certain story worlds that change. And my editors, um, Whitney and Gina, had this really lovely and ingenious fix to how to communicate time and how to communicate story. And what that was just to switch color palettes between the different story universes. And so the, um, the ways that the that color is eventually used in the book um, kind of helps make time more readable and story universes more readable to whoever happens to be consuming the story. Very cool. Um, Regina, so this is, you know, you were able to shepherd this book and, uh, and support Trung's work. Uh, and I'm sure you get asked this question a lot. What advice would you give to queer voices who have stories to tell who want to get started? And how do you find these creators? I think that people who are interested in telling queer stories, it's, it's an amazing time to be a queer creator writing a queer book right now. I mean, the, the biggest thing to know is that publishers are excited and eager to publish those stories. And they're excited to publish those stories for adults. They're excited to publish those stories for teens. They're excited to publish those stories for kids in middle school. And they're excited to publish those stories for kids even younger than that, like kids reading chapter books 
even picture book level, which is not so much my bailiwick, but um, you know, you still have lots of great stories in that space with queer themes. Um, you know, I think that the the advice that I would give young queer authors looking to bring their their voice to publishing is to start writing, start start telling those stories, um, and whether that's as a web comic, whether it's as mini comics, um, whether it's as zines, um, whether it's you know comics on Twitter, or comics on Instagram, you know things that you're you're sharing with your friends, that you're if you're going to comics conventions, that you're you're sharing at conventions. Um, you know, and we, we basically see these books at Random House Graphic from, from all over because agents are really um, who will um, have connections with publishers and represent uh, authors to them will come to us with queer creators and queer stories and say, this is amazing. You know, this, this book, you should really pay attention to it. We have people come to us directly and that's, that's great too. Um, but, you know, the, the thing to do to get your work to the point where uh, a publisher will want to pick it up is just, you know, start, start working and, and practice while you're working, um, while you're working your way up to that. Mariko, jumping off of that, uh, where did you get your start as a writer of graphic novels and comics? And, and how did you grow your career? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I feel like I'm kind of a weird hybrid example because I started off in prose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and actually, I really started off like the super old school lesbian that I am in like the spoken word stage. So the, that's where I sort of, you know, got my, <laughs> my initial criticism was from like lesbians, like right in front of the microphone who like hated my poetry. So that's like, that was like my in to the industry. Um, and then eventually, uh, I mean, really, my start in graphic novels was because of a woman in Toronto whose name was Emily Paul Weary, who had a Canadian literary magazine who decided that she was going to make comics by women. Uh, and so she asked me if I wanted to make a comic. And because I was well trained as a Canadian artist to take any opportunity that came my way, even if I had no idea what that entailed, I said yes. And then I was like, and I have a cousin who's an illustrator who will also do it. Yes. Uh, and also I have, like, like I said, like an amazingly talented cousin. So that really helps. Um, so yeah, like, I think, I think, you know, I think Gina's point is valid. Like, I, I think part of, like, first, I think it's important to know that for all, especially like, you know, BIPOC and for LGBTQIA plus creators, that your story is valuable and that people are given the opportunity to publish you, right? Like that that is, that is their opportunity. It's not just your opportunity. And the other part of it is that the best way to get any kind of recognition is by writing. Like I wrote in endless anthologies. I did lots of, you know, spoken word, but also just like basic literary events. I wrote short stories. Like I tried to do as much as possible to also like get better at storytelling. Oh, beautiful. Uh, thanks for sharing all of that. That's interesting. And everybody's path is very different. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of paths, Michael, you have made your way to developing your own solo series, um, Princess Alexander. So it's going to be the first of its kind. Tell us about Alexander as a character and the process of developing the show. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm working with Wild Brain up in uh, Canada, um, an amazing studio who I worked with in the past. And They've been really great. You know, they were they kind of. I've been working with them on a of, on a bunch of properties uh, of existing brands, and they were asking me what my own prop. Well, if you could do anything, what would you want to do? Um, and as I was saying before, like I think a lot about what the very young experience is for a queer person, and I thought back to my life, and I just remembered that long before um, I ever got up the nerve to tell a guy I liked him, let alone kiss him. Like, I knew that I was queer. I knew I was different. I knew from a very early age. And there's this whole area, um, you know, Trung talked about it a little bit, but like that that area of like knowing you're different, not knowing how your family's gonna respond to it, not knowing how your family's gonna deal with it. And I was fortunate enough to have a family that when they did find out, were very accepting right away, but accepting you and understanding you are two very different things. And the long journey towards 
okay, we accept this, but every pitfall. And I was like, I was thinking a lot about how do you tell this story in a young age way. I'm a Disney princess nerd. I love fairy tales. I love the Disney musical fairy tale story. And so I had this idea of like, well, what if it was more like there's princes and princesses and princes get typically prince boy powers and princesses get typically princessy powers. They have, the, they have the pretty magic and boys are like, I can run fast and lift things. And what if you were the youngest prince in this family and instead of getting the boy power, you got the girl power and everybody freaks out. And I wanted to sort of tell a universal story that was very specifically a queer story so that anybody could come to it and kind of like, like, all, like, like every queer kid does with a Disney princess, we lock in on the, I'm different. I wanna be part of some other world. I don't belong in this village. Like we all as queer kids lock onto that. I just wanted to flip that on its head. And I wanted to tell a story that potentially any kid could lock onto, but it was very specifically a queer experience of coming out and knowing that every instinct you had, I mean, this was at least my experience, every instinct I had was more on the feminine. I didn't want to play sports. I didn't want to do this. I want, you know, like, and so just telling that story. Um, and it's been a great journey. Um, and there's been a lot of excitement about it. Uh, working with like, an, like I said, the amazing team up in Wild Brain with some amazing artwork. Um, and coming from a big family that has been on a long journey of like figuring out how to, uh, how to make it all work and how to make it all make sense. I just wanted to tell that in a fairy tale setting okay. and get my once upon a time and happily ever after. I can't wait to see it. Uh, we're gonna flash up the promo art. Um, but on that journey to making a show, uh, Noelle, critical reaction to the final season and finale has been extraordinary, but it was a long journey for you over several years. What was that journey like? And if you could talk about it, what's next for you? It was a, um, a really interesting um, last few years for me because uh, when I started on Shira. Um, I had experience writing in animation, um, I had experience writing and drawing comics, but I had never done anything on the scale of She-Ra, um, or with the kind of legacy behind it that She-Ra had. And I was 25 when I started, so there was a lot of like, uh, most of my confidence was, was, was false confidence at the time. <laughs> and, and trying to, you know, I mean, I believed in the story I wanted to tell, but I, I didn't yet know how to actually lead a team how to manage a team, how to like make sure that everyone was working well together and happy and doing their best work. And it was a, it was a journey and I feel like it's sort of, you know, it re is reflected in the show to a, to an extent where it's, you know, the journey that Adora and the princesses go on to figure out how to work well together, figure out how to like ask for help and rely on each other and, and, and really come together as a, as a group who loves and trusts each other. And that was kind of the group that we went on as the, that was a that was the journey that we went on as a crew so i feel like uh it's been an incredibly transformative few years of just kind of like not only being able to make this show that i'm incredibly proud of with this crew who are just brilliant and incredible and and collaborative and seeing their vision come to life as well um but you know also just like kind of growing into you know the person i needed to be to do that I feel so rewarded at the end of it uh, with what we managed to make and so proud of the crew for what they've all brought to it. Um, so I think going on into the future, I'm just like very, very excited for the next thing. I don't know if I can officially say what it is just yet, but I think there's announcement coming soon. Um, but I will hint that it is something that uh, is very, very close to my heart and it's a little bit of a return in a lot of ways for me. So. I'm very excited about it and, and to kind of take what I learned on Shira and the new interests and skills that I developed while on Shira and apply them to a different kind of story. So I'm very excited um, to see what the future holds. And that is it. That's a great place to end. Um, I'm going to switch us to gallery view so um, everybody can wave goodbye. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a really great discussion really fantastic for the audience. I appreciate your participation. Happy non-San Diego Comic-Con and take care. But before you go, please check out this video preview of Alex Sanchez's You Brought Me the Ocean. And thank you so much for joining us for our Comic-Con at Home panel. I'm Jake Hyde. 
Sometimes I feel like a fish out of water. For as long as I can remember, I've dreamt of a world I've never seen. I have this strange ability to control water. Is that my purpose? Then there's Kenny. I've known him since middle school. He's always been outspoken in a way I wish I could be. Should I tell my best friend Maria how I feel about Kenny? I've hidden myself so much, even I'm not sure who I am now. Will I be doomed to drift through life in a sea of secrets?